I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. I'd like to claim I planned this episode to coincide with the current lockdown many of us are subject to, but the truth is I first contacted Nicole a while ago and it took some time to get round to recording the interview. Nicole runs a Solidarity Apothecary, an organisation supporting mainly prisoners and refugees, either by supplying herbal remedies or by facilitating the growing and making of these. And although I didn't plan it, there are parallels to be drawn between the current situation and those currently in confinement. I don't want to make light of anyone's situation or make unfounded comparisons, but there are similarities between prison and the lockdown situation. I mean, one definition of the term lockdown means to confine prisoners to their cells. There is an indefinite loss of liberty for many people across the globe. And you might say that people on the outside can leave their home for shopping or exercise, but those on the inside arguably have more close human contact. You might say one is short term and one is probably longer. One group may have more privileges than the other, and you might even say one is deserved whilst the other is undeserved, depending on your view of our prison systems. But one thing is certain, mental and physical health can suffer when we detach from nature and each other. The episode starts with Nicole introducing herself and her work. So I'm Nicole Rose, and I have a project called the Solidarity Apothecary, and the kind of mission of the project is to support what I call revolutionary struggles, so different campaigns and movements and groups of people working for social change in different ways, as well as communities with plant medicines, um, and the purpose being to kind of strengthen collective autonomy, so communities having more skills and agency to be able to meet their own health needs, um, self-defense and resilience to climate change, capitalism and state violence. But what that means in like real real terms, like practical terms, is I basically make medicines that I send to people experiencing state repression in different ways. So this could be groups of organisers on, on trial or preparing for prison or coming out of prison. And I also have a book called The Prisoner's Herbal, which is a book about plant medicines and how to use them in prison based on literally what you can find in a prison courtyard, um, which is based on my own time in prison when I was younger, like 10 years ago, and um, I've been sending that to prisoners around the world. Um, I think it's got to about 700 prisoners now. Yeah, and I also send medicines to groups of people who are taking action in different ways, for example. They're out at night trying to stop um, the bad recall in the countryside, or they're um, at different like protest sites or occupations. And then the last kind of string to the bow is I go out to northern France once a month for a week with a group called Habilists Without Borders. And we support the refugees and migrants living in the region with um, herbal medicines and first aid. Um, so it's mostly like upper respiratory viral conditions. So we give them cough syrup and chest rub and, you know, things that actually really help alleviate those kind of symptoms. Um, and we also mm-hmm. triage and work with the local doctors. So we, we take a lot of people to hospital in the clinic and bandage people up and all sorts of stuff but um yeah so that's the kind of gist of my work you mentioned obviously your time in prison is that what sparked you to start the project uh yes yes so I actually first learned about herbal medicine when I was in prison I did a distance learning course um and I worked in the prison gardens and it was kind of my first access to land you know I'd kind of grown up uh on income support and not had access particularly to knife gardens or any aspect of horticulture before prison. And, um, yeah, and in there, there's so much intense, like, medical neglect. And, obviously, you're incredibly isolated and separated from the people you love outside and from the land. So being able to know, like, who these little plants are that are, like, popping up um, in the courtyard was really empowering for me and, yeah, totally changed the course of my life. So what are the aims of the project for the people who are up, who might be in difficult situations? What do you hope that they can get out of this? So I often say that sometimes posting a box of um, like herbal medicines, so that might be um, a particular blend to support the nervous system, or if someone's going through a trial, it might be um, immune system support. Like it's as much the medicine on their body as it is the feeling of being supported. And having been through 
years of state repression with the campaign that I was involved in, um, I know how important it is to have that kind of defendant solidarity. So the kind of aim is the project to support people's bodies, like with this kind of trauma, but also to help them feel like supported um, in different ways. So, yeah. So, and I think, I think it's been quite effective. Like a lot of the defendants that I've supported over the last couple of years have like really appreciated what I've sent or, you know, they haven't got, they haven't got sick. They haven't got worse <laughs> because of the stress they're under. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's also a way to, you know, like we live in such a alienated culture where most people, you know, most people can't recognize even like 10 basic plants growing in their area. Right. So it's like, it's kind of serving multiple functions to use a kind of permaculture phrase. So they're being supported by plant medicine and they're also having that interest kind of perked up in plant medicine and then they're getting more interested in plants in general and then once you have a relationship with plants you are like your whole existence has changed right like you don't feel alone as much because they're just everywhere and yeah it just feels like life's more of an adventure because there's so much to learn and I don't know how you felt with horticulture but that's definitely been my my feeling with with plants it's very life-changing yeah I've uh, it is, and I think it's a kind of consistency of them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're kind of there year after year, even though they don't always behave in the ways that we might expect. It's just that sort of feeling of, you know, you've been through a long, dark winter, and then, but you know, something's going to pop up, and mm. then it's it's just a cycle. It kind of, keep, I suppose, keeps you grounded to a degree. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you grow plants, obviously, and you send out medicines to people, and you also um, teach people through your book how to make the medicines themselves. Wh- which usually comes first? Is there a pattern to that? I mean, they're all they're all interlinked. Like, I wouldn't be able to do this project if I had to buy herbs from all around the world, for example. Like, for me, kind of grassroots herbalism is about using your local plants and trying to build that resilience locally. Um, so I'm really fortunate to be able to access land. Uh, thankfully, my mum remarried when I was older to someone that had a bit more uh, more financial resources than we ever did. And so I kind of live on this amazing small holding and it's just completely changed my life and enabled me to grow hundreds of plants. And um, yeah, so I I have a rule in my life, which is like make medicine every day. So every day I have to do something, whether it's harvesting nettles and drying them or making tinctures or syrups or something more complicated but the kind of commitment is there's always some form of medicine out there and it's like a daily practice for me to work with that um so I kind of build up my my like my little stock of things and then throughout the year I'm also posting and sending that out to different people obviously everything's changed with the the virus a little bit um in terms of demand you know it's it's escalated so much like the kind of demand for herbal medicine um and yeah the kind of time is now really for for herbal solidarity more than ever before yeah definitely um so obviously you're probably sending out lots of a certain type of thing at the moment but in general what are some of the most popular remedies um so it's funny because a lot of people that are on trial or experiencing state repression they're often of a certain sort of constitution like quite um you know, like quite high energy, quite driven. Um, So the kind of blends that I recommend for people tend to be a bit more cooling. Um, I don't know if this makes any sense, but this is kind of um, of herbal language. But so one of the blends I make is called uh, Braveheart Blend, and it's a mixture of uh, rose, hawthorn, berry, and lemon balm. Um, And all of these plants are quite cooling, so they're very good for people that are kind of like hot and stressed and have these kind of heat patterns um so and I also make a lot of things that don't contain alcohol so I work with glycerin a lot um and I also dry a lot of herbs um I make kind of heavy heart tea tea blend which has got rose again um skull cap which is quite a strong kind of sedative nervine uh hawthorn flowers and lemon balm and again that sort of tea just like really brings you down at the end of the day um so it's more for that kind of like excitability and nervousness than it is for someone who's depressed um if someone is kind of more like low then you would want to give them plants that are a bit more kind of warming and uplifting like things like st john's wort um but there's always a fine line between 
plants that are kind of like very safe and plants that need a little bit more thinking about or you need to know if people are on other medications stuff like that so I try and be really clear about what I'm sending I send like a little information sheet with them about when when is it appropriate to use them and any kind of contraindications um and then I really send a lot of immune system support so you know I make like masses of elderberry syrup and rosehip syrup um and you may have heard of like fire cider vinegar it's kind of um apple cider vinegar infused with uh chilies and garlic and onions and it's like a really um fantastic kind of support for the immune system like helps really empty the sinuses out when you're congested it's a very old like traditional remedy um and very cheap as well and people can make it with stuff in their kitchen so yeah those are the kind of um things I focus on yeah I didn't actually understand about the cooling and the kind of warming or heating um properties of different things until I read your book and I think it just it is worth mentioning your book because if people go and buy a copy of that am I right in thinking that a co- another copy gets donated to someone who might need yeah, it? yeah so it's like a completely um regenerative project in the sense that yeah every time someone buys a copy of the prison table or overcoming burnout which is my other book um all of that money gets spent on yeah sending free books to prisoners um <clears throat> which is really important to me because obviously most prisoners can afford to buy a book. We do have some family members that will buy a book for their loved one inside, but generally I like to donate them wherever possible. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Um, so you sort of touched briefly, or we put, touched briefly on the idea of um, the benefits of prisoners connecting with nature, uh, and I'm talking about prisoners specifically. Um, how much opportunity would people have to engage with the natural world and healing plants whilst they are in prison? good question so it's so varied and unfortunately it's probably very changing right at this moment with the um, pandemic but um, lots of prisons do have do have gardens do have garden schemes have big horticulture uh, projects with training polytunnels and prisoners can get qualifications and stuff so that's like one end of the spectrum and then you get your sort of more local prisons, which are like intensely overcrowded. People are mostly locked in for like 23 hours a day. And they are lucky if a couple of times a week or once a week they get outside. So, yeah. And then obviously you have people in solitary confinement who don't have any access to to the outside pretty much. Or maybe they can go out in one courtyard, which is like purposely targeted with pesticides so that it, you know, maintains that impressive environment. So yeah it's really it's really a wide spectrum um but part of the book a section of the book is about kind of how to connect with plants in other ways if you don't have access to land so it might be reading about them drawing them kind of connecting with them spiritually and also using things that you can get in the prison so um you know even just like salt and pepper there was one older woman who I was in prison with and she was Scottish and she used to have pepper tea every time she had a cold she put like pepper in her in her hot water and like that really did the trick for her and yeah I think there are a lot of things that certain prisoners are able to access um we just produced a guide um when I got approached by some people in the U.S. who have produced a kind of self-care guide for people during COVID-19 and it's got like everything that you can order in a Californian in the Californian prison system um, so they can, for example, order garlic. Um, so we wrote a lot about garlic and we had different excerpts from the book of stuff they could order. So it's like for them, they're in constant lockdown and they can't get outside, but they could access these kind of herbs and spices uh, through their prison shops. So, yeah, so it's a really it's a real big, big variety. Mm. Uh, yeah. And I loved it in the recipes that you've got in the book, the ways of getting around sourcing different ingredients and things I thought that was really really clever (laughs) yeah I mean like (laughs) prison makes you you know it makes people incredibly resourceful like it's amazing what you see people use for what you know like even just dishcloth people have like made ornaments and uh curtain ties and all sorts of stuff with dishcloth but um yeah like for me I had to smuggle you know like you got searched at the end I worked in the garden so I, I got searched at the end of every shift before I went back to my cell and um, I'd have to I'd have to stuff all my like dandelion leaves in my bra and like you know just like all these ridiculous things. But um, it really makes you never ever take plants for granted, you know. And like I yeah, I wonder how many people listening to this have ever not been able to connect with plants. And 
yeah, it makes you feel differently about them, I think, when they're really, really precious and sacred to you because you don't know how much longer you'll have with them. I thought it was interesting what you said then about spraying the yards with pesticide. Um, I mean, is it is it a deliberate idea to kind of disconnect people from the world around them? Like, yes and no. I think I think every prison is different. And, I mean, a lot of prisons will use pesticides because that's just, like, a common thing in horticulture, which we're trying to obviously, like, consistently challenge and change. Um, but uh, one one type of prison, for example, is the closed supervision centre, which is um, it's kind of like a prison within the prison. It's, like, the most extreme form of imprisonment. And I've, I've got a friend there, Kevin Sacra, who's... Um, uh, it's a really I won't go into that story, but you can read his website online, which is just for Kev. And he's in one of these close supervision centres, and I, I visit him in there, and it's and it's like they purposely weed like every single living thing to kind of maintain this like oppressive environment. So he looks outside his window, and he just sees like a massive wall like right in front of him, um, and loads of CCTV and wire and stuff, and there's like a wire cage over the top of the prison. So it's like. Yeah, for them, like, there's not there's not any access to plants. Like, I sent him the book, mostly for, like, the herbs and spices because um, he was able to access them. But, yeah, he's just like, Nicole, like, they take every single living thing out of this place. And I think that is part of the kind of oppressive psychology of the environment. Yeah, that's utterly terrifying. Out of interest, do you kind of find that you're, you communicate more or you work more with women than men? Like men are like significantly more imprisoned, right, in this country. So mm. I think I do have more contact with men reading the book. Actually, I just got my first letter from someone saying that they want to do a distance learning course in herbalism after reading the book, which kind of made me cry. Mm. Um, That's brilliant. But yeah, uh, but no, it is it is quite mixed. Like women, trans prisoners, men, like they all, yeah, they all kind of write requesting the books. Yeah. Um, I thought that was really interesting. We, I don't think we've got time to go into it now because it is a massive subject, but I thought it was really interesting your, that you were giving talks about sexuality and gardening. Um, I can't remember what you called your Oh, talk. the it Queer Ecology course. Yeah. yeah, that's it. I think the blurb about the course was that actually some people feel excluded from horticulture, which is, again, you know, for for someone like me and probably, you know, a lot of people listening, that they just wouldn't have considered that. So that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, like, we didn't actually run that course in the end because I had quite a serious bereavement. But, um, yeah, like, I think, I mean, there's obviously different layers, right, of who's excluded from what and and people with kind of diverse sexual identities like the LGBTQ um, community. Yeah, it does feel like quite a kind of heterosexual middle-class world sometimes, right, horticulture, so... I think creating opportunities for people where that's kind of not the main worldview is really empowering. And, you know, the same kind of racially, there's like a really amazing crew called um, Land in Our Name. And they're a group of um, black and people of colour who are who are kind of organising for access to land and kind of black owned farms and stuff in the UK. So I'd recommend people checking out their work. But yeah, also Mm. part of the queer ecology thing is looking at how how we've kind of like gendered plants in this kind of heteronormative way of this is the male part, this is the female part, whereas actually sexual reproduction in plants is so much more complicated and that's really empowering for people because, you know, like for me, it's, you know, I'm I'm bisexual, but like it's really empowering when you hear that, oh, deer are bisexual or dolphins have like lesbian relationships or you know it's like really like mind-blowing when you know that also in the kind of natural world plants and animals are yeah they're totally queer they're totally not in this kind of binary model that we're kind of sold in our education um so that was the aim the aim of the course what can people do to make gardening more inclusive do you think oh that's a big question um it is i know (laughs) i think i think to make anything more inclusive you need to listen to the people that are currently excluded so the best so it would be contacting groups or individuals that are maybe on the like periphery of things and how they feel um so like what would make them feel more included so for me maybe it's 
you know, like going to an event and having a pronoun go around or having a bursary for people that are um, from a lower income background, right, that can't access like a horticultural college or take time off to volunteer for free or whatever. So it's like, yeah, I think it's it's a very like long term process, but it's worth always kind of trying to speak to people who are the most affected by that system, if that makes sense. I think sometimes people think maybe there isn't the interest out there, but I don't think that's the case uh, based on my experience. I think that it's just sometimes the interest comes from a different set of life experiences. So sometimes you need to tap into that. So if you think, you know, growing herbs is parsley and mint, then maybe you just need to expand your knowledge of what, say, herbs, for an example, mean to different people or what herbs they might want to use in terms of cooking. It's just it's just kind of widening your yeah, horizons, definitely. I suppose. And there's, like, there's loads of fantastic projects that support people leaving prison to work in horticulture. One of my best friends, Shady, from prison, she, you know, long history of in and out of prison, kind of drug trauma-related stuff, and she got a job working with a sort of social enterprise. I can't remember their name, unfortunately. Um, and she say, she stayed out of prison now, you know, because she also worked in the gardens with me. So it's like there are amazing horticultural projects that are doing sort of this social therapeutic stuff work. And I think, yeah, like anyone that have got those skills to, to work with groups like that or to set up projects in their area is like really, really important because it's not just about prison, right? It's about building a totally different world where we don't need prisons because we've, you know, we've built that community support in you know into our lives so yeah I think and I just think gardening is like the most empowering liberating thing I've ever done and I think it really offers a huge amount to to everyone right so yeah I think focusing on how to make it more inclusive is really important. I was gonna ask I think to wrap it up obviously your book is really useful to people who are interested and also so are your remedies if somebody knew somebody who might benefit from the book or from medicine how would they obtain some is it possible to order it and get it sent in or um, so yeah so it's not it's not possible to send herbal medicine into prison unfortunately um which is also why i created the book but if anyone has like a friend or family member in prison that would like a copy they can they can email me with their address and i'll send it in the post but yeah the book is really designed as like a low <laughs> like a very easy way to access plants without loads of equipment without spending loads of money just literally what have you got with your hands in your kettle you know so it is useful for people on the outside and they can order it from solidarityapothecary.org and as part of the kind of response to the coronavirus like a few herbalists like we're in the process of um how can we best offer kind of herbal medicines at this time in terms of like immune support but also and antiviral support but also really like stress support you know in this kind of traumatic situation so um i've got a uh, herbalist mutual aid directory on my website where herbalists from around the world have been submitting little profiles of themselves and they're people that are offering free or sliding scale herbal medicine so people without much money maybe people that have lost their jobs recently can still access support so that's on my website and people are welcome to contact me about that it's a bit of a weird legal situation in the uk in terms of selling medicine so it tends to be more like donation based um or free so you can see how important it is to support people like nicole and in fact nicole as they are often working on a voluntary basis as nicole said if you buy a copy of her book she will donate a copy to an inmate And there's never been a better time than now to start looking into herbal remedies to support your own health. Especially as the prisoner's herbal shows you ways to make remedies when equipment or ingredients are limited. Maybe the coronavirus is an opportunity for us temporary prisoners to spare a thought for the longer term actual ones. I realise whether prison is for reform or punishment is a long raging debate. And I'm sure there are those who are listening who come down in both camps. My dad was a repeat offender who spent most of my childhood and my adult life in prison. Do I think he would have changed if someone had shown him more kindness, allowed him access to the natural world, taught him to better look after his own physical and mental health? Honestly, I don't know, and I wouldn't bet my life savings on it. But one thing I do know is that the prison system definitely did not reform him in any way. It did not encourage lawful behaviour, 
and it didn't equip him with the skills to live a normal and productive life post-incarceration. So if nothing else, I hope we can all spare a thought for the health and well-being of those in confinement, for whatever reason and wherever they are. As you now know yourself, it's tough to deal with and so many of us gardeners are thanking our lucky stars for our gardens and access to nature right now. And if you'd like to do more to support those who have lost their liberty, reach out to Nicole. Her details are in the show notes and I know she'll tell you how you can help. I'd like to thank Jennifer Lowruel for suggesting Nicole as a guest and thank you to Nicole for taking part in the interview. Thanks to you two for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.